looking at this discussion is to go a little bit deeper on cooperative security, something which is in turbulent waters, let's put it that way. In general, European security is not as we like it. It's completely different than 1990. We had high hopes. The OSCE Charter of Paris, cooperative security was the foundation. Now, 30 years later, we have the anniversary, but it doesn't look that well. But I see Helen Conway Moret. Thank yes, I was waiting to be accepted. <laughs> Madam, yes, the Zoom technical difficulties. But I'm very happy that you're with us, uh, Madame Conway Moret. Um, you are a member of the Senate. You have been a vice president of the Senate. You are always around foreign policy. You're a member of the Socialist Party. And um, we're very happy to have you, as happy as having Neil Schmidt. And uh, I introduced the subject um, a little bit, but I will continue. Cooperative security is under threat. Uh, European security is not as it used to be nine, 30 years ago. Um, the Paris Carter, the end of history and all that. Uh, we have a lot of challenges and it's an honor to speak with you two about this, to enlighten our viewers. And um, usually talk shows are there to speak loud, to be provocative. Of course you can do this, but I would rather say this could be a little bit more soft, deeper on the subject, have a good argument here and there. And then let's see what the audience say in the second half, let's say after 20, 25 minutes, we open the floor if we have questions. Um, as I said, Europe is in troubled water. Um, the bigger countries are basically doing whatever they want, not completely, but quite a, bit, quite a bit, I have to say. The EU is facing a status they couldn't have imagined for the longest time. They're kind of in between the US on the one hand side, Russia on the other side, and bigger even, and more important, China. Um, and Germany and France are those countries who always cherish cooperative security, but the debate, not the debate, the discussion today is about, so how, how, how far can we go still with cooperative security? We had a discussion in Paris a couple of months ago, and the overall understanding among experts were, well, we have ad hoc alliances. Today this one, tomorrow that one, that's the realistic approach. My first question is, and we asked the same to the three activists, that was the first part, this is the second part, and the th third part is a discussion with uh, the rowing diplomatic correspondent of the New York Times. The first question is, um, and we asked you that question up front, do you, you don't, you too don't expect a war coming soon, but my question is, is the understanding of the challenges of European security clear and high up on the agenda. So we really don't have to worry about war. And Madame Conway Moret, I would like to start with you on that question. And then Niels, please, you are the second one. Well, thank you very much. It's, um, it's a pleasure to be with you. And it's a pleasure to uh, uh, debate with Niels, who uh, is not just a colleague, but um, I think now a, a, a partner in arms in that um, we are signing uh, articles that are published across Europe this week to defend uh, European funding for uh, defense. Um, yes, indeed, it's not just an aspiration that we would not see a war on our continent. I think um, we have everything in our hands today um, given the history that we have had on this continent, having declared two world wars in the past, um, to know the consequences of, uh, of that and the results of our countries being on their knees at the outcome of the Second World War. And I think now we have taken the measure of what war is about and uh, uh, we need to do everything that we can to prevent uh, the recurrence of that. Um, it's very difficult to see how there would be a war between European countries. However, 
um, looking at the world today, we see that uh, we do not have friends everywhere and that somehow conflicts are getting closer to us, um, namely in Syria and Libya now. Um, and that should preoccupy us, that it's not um, just what is actually happening on our territories, but how those wars and conflicts and tensions may have an influence on us. Now, um, to do that, to prevent a war, we need to work actively on building up our um, confidence that uh, we are a great continent, we are strong, there are 500 million citizens, we have an economic weight, uh, which is great. And if only we were capable of putting aside our own uh, national interests and coming together to defend our interests, having some of our allies sometimes uh, trying to divide us for their own purposes, to defend their own interests, um, I think we would actually progress uh, much faster uh, given the budgets uh, that we um, actually spent on defense, buying foreign equipment, if we were to actually spend all that money within Europe, we would have a lot of factories going, we will have a lot of jobs, and before that, we will also have a lot of research and development uh, being produced in Europe, and we know today that what we produce for the defense purpose also has a dual implication and is also very useful uh, for uh, us as civilians. Um, Thank you very much. We're starting with platforms. We are all working with Visio now. Why do we use Zoom? Why isn't there a, a German or a French platform that we could use that we will feel is secure? Everybody tells us that Zoom is not uh, the most secure um, uh, means to actually exchange, and that's what we're doing today. You know, all all the um, the research that we can do within the defense area can be used for civilians, and you know, starting with what we're doing today. Thank you very much. Too long. Great. Um, yes, I think your analysis of the status quo is perfect. Yes. For yeah. Germany, uh, we have. Um, always, and, and behind me you see Willy Brandt uh, kind of overlooking what I'm doing here, or you, we are doing tonight, um, always this understanding that the engine is here in France, in Germany, in Poland after 1990, and um, so the war is, 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 is lingering, Niels, isn't it? I mean, we can say, yes, we are united, uh, but we have problems. We have problems around the corner. We have still a war, even though it's officially not that called in Ukraine. It's what yeah, what is it all, that, yeah. that we can do? Yeah, first of all, I would like to uh, thank you for the invitation. And I'm really pleased uh, to have this discussion uh, with Elan. And um, it might not be such a provocative uh, discussion this evening, but at least it should be thought provoking. And that's what uh, we are all about uh, to do uh, this evening. And you started with a very uh, right uh, and correct uh, question about war in Europe. And you know, some even a very short time after the signing of the Paris Car charter um, in, in November 1990, at the beginning of the 90s, we had the, the first post-Cold War, real war going on, raging in former Yugoslavia. Then came Kosovo, then came Georgia, then came Ukraine. And I do not have a photograph of Willy Brandt uh, at my back, but uh, St. Sophie's Cathedral in, in Kiev. So even in Europe, within our own borders, we have experienced warfare in the last 30 years. And this is also testament to or proof to uh, the fact that 
the post-Cold War order in Europe might have been cooperative in um, theoretical terms, but in practice, we, not, we have not always lived up uh, to the challenges. And now there are even more challenges because around Europe, we have not a ring of friends, but a, a ring of fire. So Libya, Syria were mentioned. Look at uh, the Caucasus uh, with Azerbaijan, Armenia. Uh, so we are confronted with, with profound security challenges and we do not have the right uh, security architecture at our disposal. And it's not only about the rise of China and about some challenges arising from the Middle East, it even puts into question a very important feature of the cooperative security architecture in Europe, uh, which is, uh, or which used to be the role of Russia. So the idea was to include Russia in a way and the post of its uh, space more generally into a common uh, European security system symbolized by the uh, o, um, OSCE. Um, and this has not really worked out well. The only thing which provided real hard security to European countries is uh, NATO. But this was a very controversial move uh, uh, within Europe, especially vis-a-vis -vis Russia. And now we uh, have to talk about issues like who lost Russia and all, this, uh, all these ideas uh, coming out um, of a 30-year period after uh, the signing ceremony in, in Paris. Uh, so this, this shows that uh, there's a long way uh, ahead of us for establishing a real corporate security feature uh, within uh, Europe. And at the same time, I agree with Elen that the European Union as a security organization, it's also an, a, an organ, organization of collective security uh, enshrined in its, uh, in its uh, treaty, um, that the European Union has rather increased its security influence impetus in the last few years. So I would like to tell a more positive story about the last few years, although there have been so many challenges, but take JCPOA, the Iran nuclear agreement, take the still very united front against Russia following the annexation of Crimea, take even the very bad case of Brexit, uh, where we st still stand together. Um, and so I believe that in, in terms of EU security policy, there has been some progress and the European Defense Fund and PESCO is part of that. Thank you, Niels. Um, okay, fair enough. Um, so far we have a status quo, which on the one hand side is not so good, but on the other hand, according to you, we're working on it, it's, it could be worse. Now, going back to you, um, Madame conway Mori, your president has introduced um, an initiative towards Eastern Europe, especially towards Russia. He has been to Poland um, to explain it. He has clearly been to Germany and to other countries. Now, what we, the discussion we had with the um, activists for one part was they would like to see a completely different approach to foreign policy away from defense, more to talking and law. And that's what I'm coming to Russia. And one of the arguments was, well, why don't we make sure that we have enough international law and then it works out? It doesn't. Bigger countries can do not whatever they want, but in a way what they want. So Russia is not playing according to our lightning and neither is the US. But your president said, let's do something with Russia. In other words, this is an initiative which tries to cooperate not within the EU, not only within the EU, but with a country which is not changing its postal address. Is that what you understand under cooperative, not cooperative security, but a cooperative approach to get a longer lasting peace because you have to work with countries which are not always according to the lightning of, of most? 
Hmm. France has a tradition to, to speak with everybody. And um, I think um, the mistake that President Macron made was to take the initiative on its own, on his own, and um, uh, see that maybe he could reinstall some kind of dialogue uh, with Russia, and that if he were on this, um, I suppose, uh, trusted um, uh, dialogue, that he would be able then to turn to our European partners and say, you know, it is possible. I've opened the door, we all get in, and now, you know, it is safe and, and we can move forward. I think it was a mistake, because not only did our European partners not know about it, but the French people didn't, neither did his ministers. So, uh, it was a, a kind of a solo initiative. He, he seems to be, um, you know, this is, seems to be part of his own uh, personality. I mean, he behaves in this way as well on uh, French <laughs> internal policies, not just international policies. So um, I think that was a mistake. However, I think that uh, somehow his instinct is right. Um, we cannot change the, the geography. Um, Russia is attached to us on our east border. And it is in our common interests that indeed we have a peaceful and trusted partnership with that country. Anytime that uh, we do something that doesn't please Russia, we see them <clears throat> uh, getting aggressive and uh, showing their muscles to um, remind us that they are in great, a great country and that uh, if on our eastern border we have some countries that do fear uh, Russian interference, I think Russia equally fears, rightly or wrongly, uh, a NATO interference or a European interference. So at some point, somebody has to take the initiative to say, let's stop that build up of tensions. We do not like what you did in Crimea. We impose sanctions and you know, France is perfectly okay with that and we don't want to change it, even though we feel that somehow um, maybe Russia is not going to change its mind very quickly on that issue. However, on the Ukraine, we can do something and we have to do something where we can only be uh, useful if ourselves we are strong, that we are united, and that we don't live in fear of a Russian invasion. We need to re remind the Russians every time that they interfere with cyber attacks, with, that we are not naive, that we know it's coming from them, and that we um, will fight back and we have the means with sanctions and you know, your in international order and so on to um, have international um, uh, uh, if like meetings where we can denounce this. But on the diplomatic level, we need to speak to them. And we, 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 need, we, we really need to try to bring down that buildup, which we see of a new Cold War. Now, I'm going to say something a bit provocative, but somehow it is in the interest of the US to have us in this situation with Russia, simply because we need to reinforce our defense forces. And we see that Poland, for instance, is playing the game <clears throat> fully, even <laughs> more than <laughs> American expectations on the matter. Um, and that somehow we continue to be divided as to whether we should have a European defense because we do not want to offend our American partner. Uh, which is again, we're we're auto centering ourselves. Um, you know, we're 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 not moving as far or as fast as we could and should because of them. So we need to also take that into account. What is the, our relationship with um, the, the Americans today? Um, are we to defend their interests or our own? And do we want to be caught in between? Uh, an American and Russian uh, build-up of tension, American and Chinese build-up, 
where is the place of, uh, of Europe? Ah, moi j'ai perdu le, le micro. I, I can't hear you. I know, apologies, Jesus. apologies, apologies. Ah, okay. The mic, the mic um, is... Yeah, okay. yeah the, the question, Niels, um, and I introduced the subject. EU is possibly in a position which it could have never have imagined in between. Yes, we are transatlantic and yes, we're part of the NATO. We don't have to discuss that. It's very clear. But also the US is challenge, is a challenging country. It's becoming a more challenging country and possibly this has nothing to do with any administration, just how it is. The US is also wondering what to do. Um, so in, in this sense, what can cooperative security then do? Yes, we can talk to the EU, we'll talk to, to Russia and other countries, but if the EU is not so united as it is, and the EU is so needs so much cooperative security, what can be the role, for example, of Germany to make sure that we have a certain unity in the EU, which clearly we don't have, and on the other hand, um, to deal with challenges from countries which are big enough, not really looking for cooperative security. Yeah, first of all, I fully agree with Ilan on the need of, uh, for dialogue uh, with Russia. And uh, I have rather some problems uh, with the form, not uh, with the substance of President Macron's initiative. As uh, Eden rightly mentioned, it was not really coordinated with Germany and on the EU level, but there is definitely a need to engage in a dialogue with Russia um, in a, in a, uh, with, uh, without having any illusions about the nature of the regime uh, there, uh, as long as Putin is in power, but still there is a need for the European Union, for European countries to talk to Russia. And um, I would even say that I'm very glad to see President Macron taking the initiative to reinvigorate the normally format. Uh, when I entered the Bundestag uh, in uh, 2017, 2018, there was a total lack of diplomatic activity from the French side on the Ukrainian issue, on the Ukrainian war. Because the French government rightly considered that there would be only a window of opportunity for diplomatic activity after the presidential elections in both countries, in Ukraine and Russia. And that proved to be true. But now we really uh, should um, uh, catch on on that and uh, take uh, the, the initiative to bring some concrete results out of the Normandy uh, format. And there's, but there's a second condition for success in this respect, that is to have vis-a-vis -vis Russia a common European policy. And that means that we have to take into, the, into account the interests and the views of our Eastern and Central European partners, NATO partners and EU partners. There can not be any dialogue with Russia over the heads or even at the, at the detri to the detriment of their interests. And that is a very important point, often overlooked at by our traditional Western European uh, partners. And that's why I believe uh, Macron was right in going to Poland and trying to re-establish the Weimar Triangle. Uh, so I believe that many European security issues should be uh, treated within this uh, framework, not only Ukraine, maybe Belarus and other issues as well. And I believe that this is one example where European unity is important. And 
to come to the broader question you asked me about uh, European security, I believe that we need to build up European sovereignty, not only in military matters, but in diplomatic, in the, the diplomatic field, in financial, commercial, technology uh, field. Uh, this is important to have leverage other than the the simple use of military force. We, we, we know that we have to rely on our own competences potential. We cannot rely as much on the United States as we used to do. And at the same time, we are faced with more challenges. We mentioned the rise of China. And then there is one last aspect which I would like to bring into this debate, that is the fact that we, not, we do, not really, do not only need to reach out to Russia, but we also need to reach out to Turkey, which is a very difficult but crucial partner of Europe as a NATO member state, as a partner uh, of the European Union. Uh, I want to avoid a future situation where we would sit together one evening talking about the question, who lost Turkey? And we are, are on the brink of losing Turkey for different reasons. But uh, I hope that as we, we are doing or trying to do in our relationship with Russia, we also need to have a, a European agenda for our relationship with Turkey. Um, this is as important to European security and to a cooperative ap approach to European security as our uh, relationship with um, uh, Russia. And to achieve this goal, we need to deploy all our instruments. And they are not only military. They're, they're, they're economic incentives, they're different incentives, diplomatic in incentives as well, when I look at the Eastern Mediterranean. But this is very important, and I hope that our French uh, friends will join us in this effort. Um, this cannot be left alone to, to Germany al uh, alone. Thank you, Niels. Uh, a question to you both. Usually, if we talk about cooperative security, uh, we clearly we, we fastly come up with, oh, possibly need a new institution. Niels, you just said, not really necessary. Also, my point would be the problem or the challenges we have is not so much institutional, even though at the moment the OSCE is in slightly troubled water because there's a change of, of management, so to speak, um, but it's political. And therefore, again, my question, to both of you, um, is it the role of France and Germany and possibly Poland to put more energy into trying to be more political on the issue of cooperative security, European security? Are we doing enough? Has it been clear to all the countries that we do have a serious change from the last 10, 20 years. This, the, the, the future is not clear at the moment and it depends on good politics and good policy. So do you think, Madame conway Moret, that this is clear within France and within the EU and who would be the closest allies or the most important allies or allies you would like to see to put more energy, to be more engaged? There are a lot of questions, so I'm not too sure which one I will start with. The last uh, one. Are we, <laughs> are we doing pick, enough? Pick, pick, pick. Are we doing enough? Um, I don't think so. And the epidemics that we're trying to deal with showed that they can be more solidarity than they can be more cooperation, and that there are weaknesses on our continent that we can address at a national level, and I think we've all started, but equally to put systems in place and we don't need to change the institutions. I think we have everything in place. Then it's a matter of political will. And it's a matter also to think that this European project, which still remains unique, no 
continent has come together with different countries that were at war with each other over time to actually build peace, peace and move forward and actually build something together. Europe is still unique. And that's why Monet, I think, talked about, you know, making small steps that will, you know, secure the building to make sure that it is strong enough never to collapse again. And we're still building it. We're still learning. We still have sometimes egoistic approaches to the various projects where we feel that it is more important that we get the biggest part of a project than that the project succeeds at the, at the European level for our own goods. So um, I think uh, we're, we're still in, in, in the making, and, but that there is an awareness, and there, there, there is an awareness where we cannot have those Monet's small steps anymore because the world is changing very rapidly and we need to react equally rapidly if we don't want to be left behind. And um, what Neil said something earlier, which I think is very, very important, we need to be as inclusive as possible. Um, our geography makes us, with Spain and Italy, looking south as regards threats. The east part and the north part of Europe looks east. We need to keep to put all these threat analysis together and see what do we put in place to cope both with the threat coming from the south and the east. And Neil is also right. It's not a military answer that we need. <clears throat> military uh, action is the last resort. It's when diplomacy has failed and it's when everything else has failed. <clears throat> so we need to work because we have this great advantage to be at peace to be strong, to be rich as compared, you know, other uh, countries, to actually put all that we have in preserving that peace and going beyond our borders and trying to use our diplomacy because we, for our allies, are a strong ally, coherent. They know that we, they can rely on us and that is important. And that's why we need to build that force to be somehow respected and to be expect, accepted in that <laughs> first category of continent countries or co countries that are continents. Thank Spain, you very much. Russia and Russia. Thank you very much. Neil, are we doing enough? Are we understanding in Germany that the, that the European security as we know it, as we have it, is under threat? Are we doing enough politically? Well, we, we should definitely do more. Uh, and uh, I see uh, three areas uh, of improvement. Uh, one is we need to develop Europe's own capacities. There might be some need for building up military capacities independently of NATO or com in complementarity to, to NATO but it's about diplomatic, financial, economic, commercial capacities. Uh, take Iran. We, we established Instex as a special purpose vehicle for maintaining some trade channels to Iran, but this was all um, more or less made useless because of the dominance, predominance of the dollar in international financial transactions. So we need to uh, build up a strength, stronger role for the euro on international financial markets. Second point is we need better coordination between France and Germany on some important issues. Uh, I've mentioned Russia. This is also true uh, for Libya. Uh, so there, there can be, there's some room for improvement on our uh, bilateral coordination, um, which is, by the way, um, stipulated in the uh, Aachen Treaty on French-German cooperation and friendship. So we should really live up to the promise of the treaty of this uh, treaty. And then there's a third point, which was not mentioned, which has not been mentioned yet. That is, uh, we have to find a way to include 
Great Britain in our European cooperative security arrangements and especially in our arrangement uh, for a common European uh, foreign policy. There is not much we can do without the cloud, the experience of Great Britain in many areas. So I believe uh, Mrs. Mr. Johnson's uh, bizarre policy is not withstanding. We need uh, a very, uh, very stable arrangement uh, and mechanism to include um, uh, Great Britain in our EU uh, procedures. Thank you, Niels. Um, time is progressing. And, uh... Time is progressing. And... I can't hear you. It goes. Um, time is progressing, and I think um, you have other things to do. The question I have for the last one, and please be short, this was um, a result of a talk we had activists, uh, with activists, um, um, a week ago. Um, they're very much for multilateralism, they're very much for uh, cooperative security, but they themselves said they were accused of being romantic, naive, because now it's the time of hard geopolitics. Who has the most weaponary, who is tough, um, and we know the countries who behave like that. So what would be your answer? And now we, we start with Niels to say, well, what would, you be, what would be your answer to say to those who say, you know, cooperative security is actually um, something of the past? Well, I would uh, tell them, uh, just look at the past. Uh, what were the results when the law of the jungle prevailed? I believe that multilateralism is complicated and there are multilateral organizations uh, that have uh, to be reformed, but we need to strengthen at least the existing features of multilateralism, uh, especially as Europeans, because otherwise um, we uh, cannot, um, uh, cannot um, live up to the promises we as Europeans defend on the world stage. And there is one very promising example of multilateralism, that is the European Union. We should not forget about that. Madame Conway Moray, what would you answer to accusations that uh, cooperative security multilateralism is a thing of the past? That um, it is not, it is the expression of um of uh, very strong personalities who believe in the rapport de force, uh, feel that they can just impose themselves on others because they would be stronger. And it is the reason why we need to be strong too, to resist and fight for what we believe in, fight for our values and uh, not let some countries impose new world regulations or norms simply because they feel that they are stronger than we are. That was a very positive um, coming together. I didn't expect that after um, cooperative security is under threat. Thank you very much, uh, Madame Conway Moret and Niels Schmidt in different countries from different perspectives. It was enlightening. I'm happy that we had this time almost the same um, approach, but differently, clearly, and different thoughts. So, Niels, at the beginning, you said it should be thought-provoking. I think we did that. And I apologize for the light, slight hiccups with the microphone. There's nothing, nobody else to blame than me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for tuning in. And don't miss the last one with uh, Stephen Erlanger from the New York Times. Thank you very much and have a lovely evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank Bye. you. Bye.